all aboard for zero carbon bus travel. It's all about hydrogen. Welcome to the show and we're all about hydrogen and big vehicles. This bus is just one of part of the biggest rollout of hydrogen buses in Europe. Also on the show... Thomas Moore gets taken out for a spin in a hydrogen fuelled lorry. Is it the future of green trucking? I speak to the climate minister of one of the planet's most vulnerable nations to climate change and he has a message for our government. We will be putting extra scrutiny on the UK government to ensure they continue to fulfil their commitments. And it's the weekend, so I'm having a pint. This brewery thinks it's made one that's truly carbon negative. Cheers. But first... A lot of people think electricity is the answer to climate-friendly transport, but this place is betting the fleet on hydrogen. Is this the future of zero-emission bus travel? This operator in Sussex certainly thinks so, betting big on hydrogen power over battery electric. By the end of next year, 54 will be on the roads, the largest fleet in Europe. But zero emission hydrogen is expensive to produce. Hi, welcome aboard, Tom. Well, thank you. And many experts say electric vehicles are a better choice. Why have you decided to go for this technology? With hydrogen, we will get about 300 miles a day out of the bus. When if you look at battery electric, we might get 180 to 200. So when looking at it for the fastway route, it was critical that we could get a full day's worth of operation with the bus going out at 3 in the morning and potentially coming back at 1 in the morning. Very long operational days, which is why we needed hydrogen, say, compared with battery electric. I guess these buses are more expensive. That's presumably a bit of a problem, isn't it? The buses are significantly more expensive than a standard diesel bus. So we're looking at about £500,000 for this bus when a conventional diesel bus is around 270. So will it be any more expensive for people to ride on? No, no more expensive for people to ride on. Do you think that'll make a measure measurable difference to the air quality around Crawley? Oh yeah, yeah. O over time it will all add up. If we haven't got a diesel bus out every day and we're producing nothing more than water at the tailpipe, it will make a huge difference over time. So every little step we can take is going to make a big difference in, in you know, improving air quality. The fastway route linking Crawley to Gatwick runs 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The switch to hydrogen will save over 36 tonnes of carbon dioxide a week. For something quite revolutionary in terms of pollution and climate change, it looks fairly normal and the drivers say it goes much like a normal bus except it has that acceleration you associate with electric vehicles because the hydrogen is making electricity on board and it's that that drives the wheels. And one thing I really like on the dash instead of a fuel gauge you can see an H2 gauge. And the drivers here are certainly convinced. It's going to change the world I think hydrogen's the way forward. Um, range is there, I think electric buses are just aren't aren't the way forward for us anyway um, but yeah it'd be, be interesting to see where zero emission goes but in my view I think hydrogen is the way forward. Buses and coaches make up three percent of our total transport emissions so rolling out carbon free vehicles is an easy way to cut those emissions and improve air quality too. It's like hearing an automatic um, uh, air. You know, mm -hmm. place, mm -hmm. The government's committed to having thousands on the road before the next election. But with concerns over hydrogen supply and efficiency, how much of a role will it really play? I think hydrogen has definitely got a big role to play, particularly with those heavier uh, HGV vehicles, some of that earth-moving equipment as well. Why is the hydrogen coming from Holland? That suggests we haven't really got our hydrogen infrastructure in a good place. Well, we do need to do more on that. That's, that's definitely true. The government's got a big uh, energy, a renewable energy strategy coming out this summer. I'm desperate to see more uh, production here in the UK, and there is a definitely a way we can use some of our renewable energy sector to help generate some of that green hydrogen as well. You've committed to 4,000 zero-emission buses by the end of this parliament. How many have we got so far? So you've got over 3,400 uh, 3, have been funded. Um, there are hundreds on the road already. Um, we've got a separate... Hundreds on the road, you've got to get a 4,000 by the yeah, end of the parliament. We, we, That's a big gap. We're going to get there. We're going to get there. I'm absolutely convinced we're going to get there. So whether electric, hydrogen or a bit of both, the way is clear for cleaner buses. Hydrogen is also being touted as a solution for decarbonising our heavy trucks. Sky's Thomas Moore has been to see one of the first hydrogen-powered HGVs in action. 
Reaching net zero has a heavyweight problem. How to power all the lorries on our roads without producing greenhouse gases. But this may be one solution. The first British designed and built prototype fueled with hydrogen and all that comes out of the tailpipe is water. You don't have the roar of the diesel engine, you don't have the fumes of the diesel engine, more importantly, uh, but yeah, it, it's quite a, it's a nice place to live and work. It has a range of 370 miles, not far short of a traditional diesel HGV. To match that, an electric truck would need a battery weighing several tonnes, and that would mean carrying less freight. The benefits of hydrogen stack up, say the manufacturers. A hydrogen vehicle takes 15 to 20 minutes to refuel and it's ready to go again. Unfortunately, battery electric vehicles can take up to five to six hours to refuel, which is downtime for fleet operators and they cannot have that. Because the margins are so tight? Exactly. HGVs only make up 1.5% of all the vehicles on the road, but produce almost 20% of carbon emissions from transport. The government has said it will stop sales of all new diesel lorries by 2040. But there's no plan on how to do that. And not a single electric or hydrogen refuelling point for trucks on the road network. If you're a fleet manager, you need to plan ahead what vehicles you are going to be adopting. So it is a tight timeline. We need the government to be moving quicker with trials while we need that plan for how infrastructure is going to be put in place to reassure operators that as they plan their future vehicles, they know that it is going to be supported by the right infrastructure. The government will shortly announce road trials of zero emission trucks. There could even be tests of overhead wires on motorways, a system already being looked at in Germany. The downside to hydrogen is that making it from green electricity is at the moment inefficient and expensive. Scientists calculate that it would take something like 3,000 big offshore wind turbines to make enough of the gas to power all the HGVs on our roads, more than doubling the average annual electricity consumption for the whole country. But advocates of hydrogen are confident the technology will become more efficient, producing the gas at scale to keep the wheels turning. Thomas Moore, Sky News in Warwickshire. Well, to talk through what role hydrogen has with our heavier vehicles, I'm joined by Helena Bennett from the Think Tank Green Alliance and David Seabon, Professor of Engineering from Cambridge who specialises in decarbonising freight. So from those two films, Helena, we very clearly heard the message that hydrogen should be part of the answer for heavy things on the road. What do you reckon? So hydrogen is really interesting because um, the, at the moment there's not loads of supply of hydrogen, especially low carbon, clean hydrogen. So we have to be really careful about where we think we want to use it. Um, it's currently being used in a few different places, fertilizer, for example. Um, and there are parts of the economy that are going to need hydrogen um, really desperately to decarbonize. With things like um, heavy, heavy transport, so trucks and buses, there are alternatives to hydrogen. So electrification actually is a much better use of the energy than hydrogen is. Um, and we're seeing a lot of electric buses being rolled out at the moment, and we're seeing a lot of development in the hydrogen truck uh, sector as well. Uh, David, we heard from, from the people behind these buses that electric just didn't work for them because they had so far to go. So for them as a user, hydrogen was the answer, and I guess some hauliers might say the same. Uh, Electricity is perfect for buses. Right. Electric buses are being rolled out all around the world. I've just spoken to one of my partners today, just bought 600 electric buses in Delhi. There's thousands and thousands of electric buses around the world. Hydrogen buses are having a pretty poor show. Uh, there was a uh, 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 30 million euro order of hydrogen buses in Lausanne in France cancelled last year because the buses turned out to be six times more expensive than electric buses. Right, so, so even when the distances are long, which was their point at Crawley? Even when the distances are long, you can easily get hundreds of miles of range from an electric bus uh, and there's all kinds of options, particularly urban buses, there's all kinds of options for charging them at either end of the line uh, or swapping buses out in the middle of the day. Uh, so we're seeing electric buses really taking over and hydrogen buses are really not going to do very well. They're very expensive. Hydrogen buses are nearly double the cost of electric buses and they cost at least three times more to run. 
Alan, is it fair that we should have an ecosystem that isn't either or, but does have both, or is that just kind of dodging the difficult decision? <laughs> I think in, the problem is investment in things like hydrogen buses today, as David highlighted, could mean stranded assets in the future for some councils or cities that are investing in hydrogen buses. Meaning you buy something and then it doesn't work in the future? Well, it won't, yeah, it might not be economically competitive in the future, or even now, in fact, as David's highlighted, with a few examples of, of where electric, electric buses are, are already out-competing hydrogen buses, um, especially somewhere like the UK. We're not a very big island, and actually the range of that you can get from big batteries in, in buses and coaches now is completely fit for purpose for the size of the island that we are. Mm. David, I've, I've heard you explain why hydrogen is relatively inefficient as an energy source. Can you give me a kind of potted version of that? Well, the problem is that when you, you take electricity, which is really high quality energy, when you make it into hydrogen, you make it into a much lower grade of energy. And that energy, uh, when you convert it back into work to push the bus along, it only gives you about 30% of what you started with. Mm -hmm. So you start with, you know, 100, and by the time you've gone through this process of making hydrogen and compressing it, storing it, and all that stuff, putting it into a fuel cell, you've only got about 25 or 30 left. Mm -hmm. So that means you've wasted uh, at least two thirds of the, of the energy. And you have to pay for that energy that uh, is wasted, and that's why it's so expensive, because yeah. you don't get much out for what you pay. Helena, hydrogen is storable and there are times when we're turning off our wind turbines because they're making too much uh, electricity. Would there be an argument for saying instead of curtailing our electricity, our wind turbines, we should be making that into hydrogen? Uh, there, there is an argument for that, yeah. So that's, that's more about the production of hydrogen rather than the end use of it, which is what this discussion about buses is, is really about. And I think but the end use, the production comes into it on the efficiency thing that, that David was yes, just saying. Yes, yeah, hydrogen, hydrogen will, I think, just to be really clear, hydrogen will have very important uses in decarbonising certain which are? parts of the economy. Um, steel and heavy industries especially. Um, I think we think there are some uses in things like uh, fuel for aviation, for, for long distance um, sustainable aviation fuel. So just very briefly, hydrogen got a place for moving stuff along the roads? Yes no, or no? Not at all. Helena? Uh, in most cases, no. OK. Helena, David, thank you very much indeed. We're off to a break now, and afterwards we'll be back talking to someone from one of the most climate-vulnerable states in the world. Welcome back to the show, and you find me close to the headquarters of the International Maritime Organisation, where a historic deal has just been thrashed out, which for the first time seeks to limit carbon from shipping. And this really matters because emissions from shipping are about 3% of total man-made carbon emissions. Well, I'm joined now by Ralph Vegan Vanu, who's uh, Climate Adaptation, Energy and Environment Minister for Vanuatu, one of the often called vulnerable Pacific Island states. What was agreed on emissions from shipping and does it go far enough to satisfy you? So what was agreed here at the IMO in London is the first time ever that we have a greenhouse gas emission strategy, a decarbonisation of shipping. The international shipping industry, all countries in the world agreed to decarbonise shipping uh, with certain targets, using certain mechanisms by certain dates. Um, just briefly, what kind of techniques are they using? Because, I mean, are they going to change the way ships are fuelled or is it offsetting? What, what's in mind? So there's a fuel standard that has to be agreed, a fuel standard with far lower uh, carbon, and also, of course, all, taking into account all the alternative fuels, because now you have alternative non-carbon fuels available like. for ships, like hydrogen, like biofuels. So setting a standard that the industry can take as a direction on the kind of fuels it needs to develop and the kind of ships it needs to develop that are going to use those fuels to achieve this net zero by 2050. Did it go far enough for you? What happened here didn't go as far enough as we were coming here hoping for with our level of ambition. But what we have, with the, especially with the targets agreed to, uh, we feel that the 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, trajectory that came out of the Paris Agreement is still within reach. It will require the highest level of ambition right now and urgency and really implementing the measures effectively and urgently. But if we get that highest level of action now going forward, and that's something that we'll be pushing, we can keep 1.5 within reach. We often talk about Vanuatu as being a, a vulnerable uh, Pacific state. What does that mean in practice? How kind of vulnerable are you? The United Nations classes Vanuatu as one of the most vulnerable countries in the world, perhaps the top three. Uh, that means that we experience um, all the 
climate change impacts, which is increasing intensity and frequency of cyclones, increasing intensity of heavy rainfall, flash flood events, all these sort of things. Also, because we are on the Pacific Ring of Fire, we get all the volcanoes and earthquakes and tectonic, tectonic geohazards. Uh, also, because uh, we are a very poor country, we used to be one of the least developed countries of the world, now we are at the bottom of the developing country. Rung, it means our capacity to respond to these disasters is not as good as it would be if we were a developed country. And so that package of extreme vulnerability naturally, plus very low financial capacity, makes us one of the most vulnerable countries to climate change. We're in the heart of Westminster here, close to the nerve centre of the British government, and there's been a lot of suggestion recently that the British government has kind of lost its leadership role on the international stage when it comes to climate. What do you think? I think the um, recent resignation by Lord Zach Goldsmith um, has put a focus back on the leadership of the UK. And I'm very encouraged by the response of the government that it is in fact not reneging on its pledge for climate finance. And it's starting to indicate how it's going to possibly meet it. Yeah, let, let's just dig into that a bit for people who don't know. So the, there was a, a pledge, I think it's many, many billion pounds, I think it's 11 billion pounds. 11.6 billion 11. pounds. 11.6 billion to help out with climate finance. Uh, Lord Goldsmith suggested that the government was moving away from that. Some other commentators have as well. Government's denied it. You think that they're, they're going to stick with it, do you? I think there's much more uh, spotlight on the UK government right now because of what Lord Goldsmith did. Um, and I think the responses we're getting from the government show that they've got renewed vigour to stick with and implement that figure. And really, there's going to be a difficulty in, in providing it, and that was what Lord Goldsmith was talking about. Mm. And really, I, it, it really now rests on the Prime Minister and the Chancellor to make sure they implement that in full, as the rest of us are expecting them to do. But more widely than that, in the last year or so, have you felt there's been a little bit of a drift away from being at the centre of the climate argument from the UK government? It's been a very difficult last 12 months, but I know that here at the IMO, the UK was right there in terms of the highest ambition. They were with us, the Pacific. And I was really help, glad to see that in the IMO itself. I think at COP, uh, there was really high ambition at Glasgow two years ago. Last year in uh, Sharm el Sheikh, we started to see that wane and it was quite a disappointing COP for us. Yeah. So it's good to come to IMO and see the UK right out the front again. And we hope that'll be translated into what we see going into COP. It strikes me like you've got your eye on them. You're keeping watch, is that fair? We're definitely <laughs> keeping a very close watch on what the UK does because the UK has professed itself to be a climate champion, a high ambition uh, partner. And um, especially now with, um, you know, Lord Goldsmith was a great champion for the climate and for the environment. And especially now that he's gone, we will be putting extra scrutiny on the UK government to ensure they continue to fulfill their commitments. Ralph Reagan Vanu, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, now an update on a story we brought you a few months ago about temperate rainforests. We went to Dartmoor and met Guy Shrubsole, who's seeking to protect these vital ecosystems. Well, now Guy has had a significant win with a very royal landowner. So Wisman's Wood is a wonderful fragment of temperate rainforests high up on Dartmoor. Uh, an, an amazing Atlantic oak wood of gnarled old ancient oak trees dripping with lichens and mosses and all the things that characterize a temperate rainforest in Britain. But it's very, very small, just eight acres in size. So what's been wonderful this week has been the announcement of a plan by the landowner, the Duchy of Cornwall, uh, owned by Prince William, uh, working with their tenant farmer and with Natural England to regenerate and expand Wisman's wood. And the plan is to simply allow uh, the wood to expand naturally uh, by re restricting certain forms of grazing by sheep, and the plan is to double the size of Wisman's Wood by 2040, which is absolutely fantastic. Now, it's been a long week and I could do with a drink. Luckily, I'm right outside a brewery that's making a pint or two that claim to be carbon negative. While it may not look like it, this pint is a little bit different. Brewers here in South London believe it's the first carbon negative pint without using any offsets like tree planting. Okay. Possibly too early, I've got to earn it. Um, why have you done this? Yeah, we've made this product because we want to make great tasting beers that are helping solve our climate crisis. Can you show me how it's done? Yeah, let's go and have a look. The secret is in the barley they're using. 
This is the barley that we use to make the beer. It's been grown in fields with poly crops, three different crops. There's no tilling, there's no pesticides, herbicides, none of that. It's natural. When it comes to climate change, what's the difference between this barley and normal? So normal barley per day for us has a carbon footprint of about one tonne of CO2, whereas this barley has a carbon footprint of minus seven tonnes. Great for the ingredients. What about the process? Let's go and see. Um, we've got an innovation that we're doing next door, which is recapturing the hops that we use. So the beer's coming through this machine and it's separating out the hops from the beer and creating this dry powder work. So those are hops that have been used already. When we use hops, we generally throw half of it away, like an orange. Cut it in half, we juice one half, we throw the other half away. We're just capturing that other half and making sure we use that too. Reducing the carbon intensity of beer needs attention from growing of the ingredients all the way through to the brewing and the packaging. And that's why it's such a hard goal to reach. Ben has crunched the numbers. What is carbon negative here and what isn't? <laughs> yeah, just the beer in the kegs um, as a packaging type at the moment is carbon negative. We're looking to roll that out across the cans and the beer in the cans as well. Um, but it's going to take some changes to packaging style and, and operationally to, to get that down. So what is it that makes the, the kegs carbon negative but potentially not the cans? Yeah, so kegs beer, kegs are actually reusable, so they're just washed out and cleaned comparatively to the cans that have to be recycled, which is um, energy intensive, which subsequently means emission intensive yeah, as well. Yeah. I promised I'll be back. This beer is 10% more expensive, so is the demand there. It's not just this brewery that are doing this. We've seen some big brewers getting in on this act. They must think there's an advantage there. Yeah, certainly. I think moving towards carbon neutral or moving towards carbon negative is something which is going to be increasingly important for, for breweries. The government have got set legal targets by 2050 to, for all businesses to be net zero emissions. Do we know if customers are prepared to pay a little bit more for climate friendly beer yet? Um, I don't know if we know the answer to that exactly, but we're, we're certainly seeing, I mean, the way that Gypsy Hill have done it is to be really forward in the way they're promoting the beer. You know, they're selling it as a carbon negative lager. They're putting it in there in the branding. It's about educating consumers, helping them understand why if you use higher quality ingredients, if you use lower environmental impact ingredients, then that is ultimately going to produce a better beer, but a lower impact beer that's perhaps worth a bit more money. With breweries now also on the conveyor belt towards net zero, could greener pints soon be pulled at your local? Well, that's it for this week. Don't worry, just leave me here. In the meantime, you can catch up with all your climate and environment news on the Sky News website and app, or by scanning the QR code that is on your screen right now. I'll be back next week in Bristol, where a new onshore wind turbine is helping some of the poorest communities. In the meantime, cheers.